Now, the Bible tells us that not only Saul of Tarsus, but also all of the New Testament authors clearly tell us that God does not have two peoples, the Jews and the church, and that he has one plan for the Jews and he has another plan for the church. That is an idea that has come up in the last 150 years in the Christian world, that God has one plan for the church, which is going to be taken away to heaven seven years uh, before the tribulation, and uh, they're going to go to heaven, and then the Jews are going to be left behind, they're going to reestablish the sacrifices, and they're going to suffer terrible tribulation. The Bible teaches, and especially the Apostle Paul, that God has only one true people, and that people are defined by their acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, we're going to go through a list of things that show that God has only one people. John chapter 10 and verse 16. Here Jesus is speaking, and I want you to notice what he says. John chapter 10 and verse 16. Jesus says here, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. What does he mean, this fold? What, what does he mean by this fold? He means the Jews, because he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We already read that. So he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be two flocks and one shepherd. Ah, uh -uh. one flock and one what? One shepherd. Now, lest you're wondering whether he's talking about the Gentiles when he says that there are other sheep not of this fold, let's go to John chapter 11, verses 51 and 52. John chapter 11 and verses 51 and 52. After Caiaphas says that it's necessary for one man to die and that the nation doesn't perish, notice what we're told in John 11, verse 51. Now this he did not say on his own authority. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for that nation. Now listen carefully. What nation is that? The Jewish nation. That he would die for the nation. And now notice. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Was he only going to gather the Jews to himself? No. He was going to gather the Gentiles to himself as well. In other words, God doesn't have two folds, a Gentile fold and a Jewish fold. He says, I'm going to bring the Gentiles, and there's going to be one fold, and there's going to be one shepherd. The Bible also tells us that there is only one Israel, and that Israel is defined by your relationship to Jesus Christ. If you are Christ, you are Israel. If you are not Christ, you are not Israel, you are not a Jew. And you say, where does the Bible say that? Let's read from the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Here the Apostle Paul says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. So is it possible for a Jew to be one outwardly and not be a Jew? Of course. For he is not a Jew who is one out outwardly. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one what? Inwardly. And circumcision is that of the what? Of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, because the Jews love the letter, but they didn't have the spirit, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Is it possible to be an outward Jew and not be a Jew? Absolutely, according to the Apostle Paul. Now notice Romans 9, verses 6 through 8. The same idea that there's only one true Israel, and that's defined by your relationship to Jesus Christ. Romans 9 and verses 6 through 8. Here the Apostle Paul says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Are all Israelites Israelites? No. The Apostle Paul is saying, Not all Israel is Israel. <laughs> now, who is Israel then? Let's continue reading. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Are all the seed of Abraham the seed of Abraham? 
No, absolutely not. He says, nor are they all children because of the, they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. And now he explains what he means. That is, those who are children of the flesh. These are not children of God. Who are the children of the flesh? The literal Jews who have not accepted whom? Christ. So he says, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, that is the promise of the Messiah, are counted as the seed. Are you understanding this? In other words, being Israel or being a Jew is not defined geographically or ethnically or genetically. It's defined by your relationship to Jesus Christ. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, and then we'll go to verses 26 to 29. We alluded to this, but let's read it once again. It says there in Galatians 3 verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So who is the only true seed of Abraham? One, Christ. You say, but didn't we just read that we are seed of Abraham? Yes, we are, but not in a primary sense like Christ. Only if we join Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. Notice verse 26. For you are all sons of God, how? Through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on what? Christ. Now notice, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now notice, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So how does one become Abraham's seed? If you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed. So my question is, those who are outside of Christ, who are literal Jews, are they Abraham's seed according to the biblical definition? Absolutely not. Because we're speaking about a spiritual relationship with Christ that makes you a spiritual Jew so to speak. Now, the Bible also says that Jesus has only one body. He doesn't have two bodies, the body of the Jews and the body of the church. He has one body. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 18. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 18. Here the Apostle Paul is writing again. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, those are the Gentiles, have been brought near how? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both, that is Jew and Gentile, what? One. And has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself, how many new men? One new man from the two, that is from Jew and Gentile, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. Through him we both, that is Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit to whom? To the Father. How many bodies does Jesus have? One Jewish body and one Gentile body. No, he has one body composed of Jew and Greek, or Jew and Gentile. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Here the Apostle Paul writes, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into, what? One body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into what? One Spirit. So how many bodies are we talking about? How many spirits? One spirit. Notice Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. This is a beautiful message to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul is saying to the Gentiles, if you receive Christ, you are Jews. You are spiritual Jews. You are Israel. Because he who is in Christ is Abraham's seed. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6. That the Gentiles should be what? Fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ 
Through what? Through the gospel. How many bodies does Jesus have? One. How many folds does Jesus have? One. Now I want you to notice that he only has one city. You know, he doesn't have the earthly Jerusalem for the Jews and the heavenly Jerusalem for the church. That's preposterous. It's not biblical. Notice Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. By the way, the New Jerusalem is called the city of the Lamb, the Lamb city, right? And the Lamb is its light. Now notice Revelation 21 and verse 2. It's speaking here about the New Jerusalem. And it says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her what? Husband. So Jerusalem has, uh, uh, the husband has how many cities? Has only one city. Now, that city is composed of Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. Not only New Testament saints. Notice Revelation 21 and verse 12. Revelation 21 and verse 12. Speaking about the city, it says, Also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the what? Of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Whose names are on the doors of the city, or the gates of the city? The twelve tribes. So is the Old Testament represented there, the Old Testament church? Absolutely. Now, what names do the foundations of the walls have? Notice Revelation 21 and verse 14. Revelation 21 and verse 14. It says, Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. How many cities did Jesus have? Only one city, composed of Old Testament saints and composed of New Testament saints. Because the names of the tribes are on the doors or on the gates, and the names of the apostles are on the foundations of the walls. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, and I'll amplify this thought that Jesus has only one city. Notice Hebrews chapter 11, we'll read verses 9 and 10, and then we'll read verses 13 through 16. This is speaking about Abraham in the Old Testament. It says, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited, now listen, this is Abraham. Was Abraham an Old Testament saint? Was he, uh, was he the founder of the Jewish nation, according to the Jews themselves? Yeah, they said, we are Abraham's seed. Now notice what it continues saying in verse 10. What city did Abraham look forward to? The earthly or the heavenly Jerusalem? The heavenly. Verse 10 says, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And now let's go to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. It's talking about the Old Testament saints. But having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a what? If they're strangers and pilgrims, they're seeking a homeland. What is that homeland? It's that little city over in the Middle East today, right? No, absolutely not. Notice verse 15. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they came out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better. That is a what? A heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Did the Old Testament saints look forward to the New Jerusalem? Yes, they did. How about the New Testament saints? Absolutely. Is there one city for all of God's people from all ages? Absolutely, not two cities. Now let's look at it from a different perspective. How many wives does God have, spiritually speaking? <laughs> he has one. But those who believe that God has two mutually separable peoples would make God a bigamist. Because he has the church and he's married with the church, but he's also married with Israel. And so he has two wives. The Bible doesn't sustain that. God has one bride and it's the church of all ages. Old and New Testament. Let's notice that. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. And then we're going to jump to verse 5. It says there in verse 1 of Revelation 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. With the moon under her feet. And on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now uh, what does this woman represent? We've already studied this. Represents the Old Testament church right? 
Was Jesus born from uh, the line of Abraham and from the line of David? Absolutely. He was born from the Old Testament church. Who is the child? The child is Jesus Christ. Now, when John sees this woman, does he see the woman at the Old Testament stage or the New Testament stage? It's the Old Testament stage because the child hasn't been born yet. Does the mother exist before the child? So is the mother the Old Testament church? Of course. So notice that this woman is going to bear the child. This is the Old Testament church that's going to bring Jesus into the world. But now I want you to notice that the very same woman flees to the wilderness for 1,260 years after the child is caught up to God into his throne. Is it the same woman? So is the Old Testament church and the New Testament church, are they the same woman? They're the same woman at different stages. Are you understanding me? Let's read verse uh, 5 uh, and verse 6. It says she bore a male child, that is the woman, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. That's the ascension of Christ. And then notice verse 6. Then the woman, is it the same woman? Absolutely, it's the same woman. It says, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Is that the New Testament church or is that the Old Testament church? That's the New Testament church because Jesus has already ascended to God into his throne and now this refers to the period when the church was persecuted during the Middle Ages. Are you understanding? So God has how many brides? How many wives does he have? One wife compared of, uh, composed of Old Testament and New Testament church represented by one woman only. Now the Bible also says that God uh, has only one tree representing all of his people from Old and New Testament, Jews and Gentiles. You say, now where does the Bible teach that? Have you ever read the story that we find in uh, Romans chapter 11 about the tree, the, the, the tree that had natural branches, and then you have wild olive branches that are ingrafted into the tree. Now let me tell you what you have there, because we don't have all the time to look at all, all of the details. I'm going to read the passage in a few moments, but I want you to get, to get this clear in your mind. The tree has natural olive branches that are retained on the tree. Okay? The tree represents Jesus Christ. He is, uh, he is the tree and we are the branches. Okay? So the natural branches are retained. Those who are, are the ones who accepted Jesus Christ. Then there are natural branches that are cut off. Why are they cut off? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. You can read it there, and I'm going to read it in a few moments. Then you have natural branches that after they're cut off, they're, they're, they're grafted in again. What would that represent? It represents the fact that at first they rejected Christ, like whom? Like Saul of Tarsus, and then he accepted Christ, and he's what? And he's regrafted into the olive tree. Then you have wild olive branches, which represents the Gentiles, and the wild olive branches are grafted into the tree. But then the Apostle Paul says that if the wild olive branches come to reject Christ, the wild olive branches will be cut off from the tree. Now what is the key in this whole passage? The key is who you are attached to. What makes you part of the tree? Your acceptance or rejection of whom? Your acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ. Now let's read the passage. It's found in Romans chapter 11, and it's a rather lengthy passage, but let's read it. It's verse 17 through verse 26. Here the Apostle Paul says, And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, speaking to the Gentiles here, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. In other words, don't make fun of the natural branches that were cut off. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said. Now notice why these branches were broken off. Because of unbelief they were broken off. Unbelief in whom? In Jesus. And you stand by faith. Why were the wild olive branches uh, grafted in? Because they had faith in Christ. Why were the natural olive branches cut off? Because of unbelief in Christ. And then he says, do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. 
on those who fail severity, but towards you goodness if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. Are you catching the picture? And they also, if they do not continue in what? In unbelief will be grafted in. What's the key here? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? You're part of the tree if you've accepted Christ. You're cut off from the tree if you don't accept Christ. But both Jews and Gentiles are grafted into one tree. Verse 24, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. And then he explains that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So there's blindness among Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now what happens when the fullness of the Gentiles come in and join with the Jews in one body? Notice what we find in verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved. What does it mean all Israel will be saved? What is Israel composed of according to the context? It's composed of Israel plus what? plus the Gentiles that are grafted into the tree. In other words, when Jews and Gentiles are grafted into the tree, then all Israel will be what? Saved. Now the question is, what is Israel? Does the Apostle Paul define what Israel is? Of course he does. It's not literal Israel over in the Middle East. It is spiritual Israel. Now, we find in the Bible that there is also going to be only one bank banquet table in the kingdom. God's not going to have one banquet table for the Jews and another banquet table for the Gentiles. Right after healing the son of the centurion, Jesus spoke these words in Matthew chapter 8 and verses 11 and 12. By the way, the centurion was a Gentile, wasn't he? So now Jesus is going to give the lesson. He's going to say this centurion had more faith than Israel. And now notice what he says. Verse 11, I say to you, that many will come from east and west, those are the Gentiles, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob literal Jews? Yes. Were they also spiritual Jews? They, they, they were because they accepted Christ in promise. And so it says, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now listen carefully. But the sons of the kingdom, who are those? The literal Jewish nation that rejects Christ. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer what? Darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How many people are going to eat at the banquet table? Only Jews are going to eat at the banquet table. No, Jews along with what? With Gentiles. What about those who reject Christ? They will not eat at the table. So once again, what is the key? Is the key to be a literal Jew or not be a literal Jew? No, the key of this whole thing is your relationship to whom? To Jesus Christ. Now the Apostle Paul also said there is only one spiritual temple. You know, the temple in Jerusalem has absolutely no significance today. It could be rebuilt but it has no prophetic significance whatsoever. Some people say, well, doesn't the Bible say that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God showing himself to be God? Yes, the Bible does say that, but we need to understand which temple the Apostle Paul is talking about. Most theologians take, take it for granted that he's talking about that temple over in the Middle East. But how does the Apostle Paul define the temple where the Antichrist is going to sit? That's the key. Allow Paul to interpret Paul. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. And by the way, our next lecture is about the Antichrist who sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. This lecture today is preparatory to that one. We wouldn't be able to fully understand that lecture without this background that we're studying today. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now therefore, the Apostle Paul says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. He's speaking to the Gentiles but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Are they members of the same household? Absolutely. And now notice, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
The apostles would be New Testament and the prophets would be what? Old Testament. Jesus Christ himself being the chief what? Cornerstone, the one that holds it all together. So are these literal stone foundations or are these people foundations? These are spiritual foundations. Is the cornerstone a literal stone or is it a person? It's a person. It's a, this is a spiritual temple with spiritual foundations and a spiritual cornerstone. Verse 21, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a what? Oh, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being what? Built together. We are the stones. First Peter chapter 2 says we are the stones that are being built up on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Let me ask you, what is the Shekinah today that is in that temple? Let's finish reading the text. Verse 22. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of whom? Of God in the Spirit. Does the church have the Shekinah today? Does it have God's Shekinah glory? Yes, what is the Shekinah glory? It is the Holy Spirit. We can't see Him, but He is present in the church. Are you with me? So, for the Apostle Paul, what is the temple? Is the temple the little, literal building over in the Middle East that's going to be rebuilt and there's going to be a third temple? Absolutely not. For the Apostle Paul, the temple is what? Is the church. Built upon the, found, the writings of the prophets and of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So when the Bible says that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God showing himself to be God, where should we look for the Antichrist? We should look, look for him sitting where? In the Christian church. Not in the literal temple in Jerusalem. 